we can go ahead and get started. All right, so welcome to Big Atlas Weekend, everybody. This is the kickoff, so we just wanted to, you know, get everything started, get excited, share some information with you guys so you know what to expect this weekend and how to get the most out of it. Um, I'm Paula Mandarino. I'm with the North Carolina Bird Atlas. I'm part of the Outreach Committee. Um, in case you all don't know, we have people from four different states. We have North Carolina, New York, Maryland, D.C., and Maine all with us today. So um, it's exciting that we get to come together and celebrate this together. So, um, Doug, do you want to talk about the how this meeting is going to function with Zoom and everything and introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. So I'm Doug Hitchcock, the um, outreach coordinator for the Maine Bird Atlas. Uh, as you've probably noticed, we're using the webinar feature of Zoom. So uh, you'll just be seeing panelists as they uh, come on um, throughout the evening. Uh, as you might have also noticed, the chat just goes to us panelists as well. So um, as you post in there, just be aware that um, other folks cannot, uh, other participants, I should say, cannot see, but all the panelists uh, can. Being a webinar, we also have the Q&A feature, um, which is going to be a better way for us to kind of organize uh, any questions that you have that come in. So um, uh, especially we'll, we'll have our, uh, our keynote speakers a little later on, um, but we'll try to get in a little Q&A as well earlier. So make sure you use the, um, we'll, we'll try to monitor both the, uh, the chat um, and I, as, as is, um, put in here, I guess, uh, you, you can put, uh, to panelists and attendees in the chat. Um, but I know by default it's set to panelists. So, uh, I don't think people are seeing too much else, um, except it looks like Sandy just pulled it off. So you can do that in the chat. Uh, but if you do have questions that you'd like to, uh, get addressed, do try to use that Q and A feature. Um, that'll certainly make it a lot easier for us to, to handle. Um, so with that, uh, maybe I'll let Paula just say what our, our schedule is going to uh, look like for, for tonight. Yeah, so um, tonight, after this short little intro, we're going to do, um, we're going to talk about like the entire Big Atlas weekend schedule, uh, the way the competition works with the categories and the prizes. Uh, we'll have a few announcements for you guys, and then we will hand the floor over to our guest speakers. Um, in there, we're going to have a couple moments where we're going to do those Q&A sessions like Doug talked about. So yeah, just continue to post your questions in the Q&A section, and we'll, we'll go through those and, and make sure we can answer everybody's questions during those allotted Q&A times. So yeah, go ahead and get started. All right, so the big goal of the Big Atlas Weekend is simply to bring more awareness to breeding birds. Um, I don't know about you guys, but a lot of times when I go out birding, I kind of get caught in the excitement of, you know, looking for new birds or looking for rare birds and adding to my life list. So um, the really exciting thing about atlasing is it's an opportunity to see birds in a new way. So it kind of brings that new excitement to birding and helps you see common birds in a new way. Um, and so each of our four states are conducting an atlas right now. So we really wanted to come together and celebrate this exciting wonder of breeding birds together. So um, we just wanted to make a competition out of it and make it fun. So um, if by the end of this weekend, whether you've atlased a lot before this weekend, or this is your first weekend atlasing, if you have experienced breeding birds and you've had fun, then you've done it right. So that's our primary goal. And uh, as Paula said, it is, you know, going to be fun and, and certainly a fun competition. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, at least in hopefully your own home states, um, uh, it, it's fun to have four different states doing atlases right now. Uh, a fun thing to kind of look at is essentially how different some of these atlases are or, or how different the atlases have been in different states. So uh, this, this first column, just looking at the number of atlases that are, um, uh, I guess, 
including the one that's that's currently being done. But um, at the number of atlases that are that will be completed in the state. So Maine's on its second. Uh, fun to see that Maryland, DC, and, and New York are have already completed their second and are now starting their their third. And um, this is the the first one for North Carolina. And um, we obviously won't go into it tonight, but there's just there's so much value in doing these kind of atlasing efforts and especially seeing the change over time. The other fun thing to look at state by state is kind of what year we're on. Um, here in Maine, we're, we're just starting our fourth year and uh, really trying to you know, drive effort out to priority blocks and, and get some of our blocks completed really as, as fast as possible. But um, as you can see, the, the other states, uh, New York, Maryland, DC, both starting their second of, of five years for, for each, and then North Carolina just getting uh, into their first. So all of us Mainers in, in a, another two years will uh, we'll have to pick where we're gonna spend our vacations. Um, uh, North Carolina sounds all right. Uh, so then looking at the number of priority blocks across the state that, um, that have some data in them, it, it uh, is a fun one. I enjoy this comparison because here we are four years into the main atlas and 94% and of our priority blocks have at least been visited, which is fun to look at, um, you know, Maryland, DC, where arguably it's a little bit easier to get around that state. Um, there's some priority blocks in Maine that may require a plane. And I apologize for being a little biased towards, towards Maine. Um, uh, but anyways, you, you, it's fun to see how this breaks down. And really my favorite column is just looking at uh, the number of volunteers so far in each state. Um, I'm really excited to look at these numbers after this weekend. We really hope that this event, again, as we kind of talked about it being um, a fun competition, but also just trying to bring in more people from the public um, uh, to take part in this. So. Uh, I'm really excited to see how these numbers bump up after this uh, kind of targeted effort for the weekend. The last thing I wanted to talk about um, is really just kind of the, the fun and, and arguably, you know, important aspect or one way that we approach atlasing. I think Paula mentioned, you know, we, uh, a lot of us, I'm sure, are, are maybe birders first and, and fell into atlasing as part of our, our hobby. But um, I like to show this picture. This was the first bird that I confirmed for the main bird atlas. And this was during a, a, a van trip. I was leading a bunch of us birders going out, trying to basically see as many species as we could in a day and, and just, you know, tick off all the species. We were down um, basically by the coast looking for sea ducks and arguably not appreciating the birds that we were seeing. You know, they were just another check mark on our list for, for the day. Um, and it was fun, you know, we, we saw our first rock pigeon as we were driving out of Portland, like ignore them for the rest of the day. Until we saw this one that was actually, you know, picking up nesting material, uh, flying off with it. It was slowly starting to build a nest underneath this little walkway platform. Um, and it really made us kind of stop, uh, really <laughs> threw quite a wrench in the, the day's plan of trying to see as many species as possible. Cause we ended up spending 20, almost 30 minutes just watching these rock pigeons, these common birds uh, doing really cool uh, nesting behaviors and seeing some of the, the displays that they would do. It really made us appreciate these birds that we had otherwise, you know, just kind of dismissed so quickly. So whether it's the rare, unusual or the, the common and, introduce non-native species, um, every bird counts for these atlases. And, and I like to kind of always keep that in mind as we think about some of the effort that we're putting into these. Yeah, I just, I wanted to say one more thing about this uh, appreciating birds in a new way. Um, so I'm actually not a very avid birder. I've, I'm more of a novice. That's what I would consider myself at least. I've, I've only been birding for a few years. And um, uh, so I think the, um, the opportunity that Atlas Inc. provides kind of reminds me of when I was first starting to bird wash because kind of like Doug was saying, you start seeing common birds and, and doing these really wonderful things. Like instead of just seeing a blue bird, like 
you know, when you're at the park in passing, seeing one like raise a family in your backyard is really exciting. And it kind of has that zest that kind of had when you first started bird watching, or at least that's my experience. So um, it kind of reminds me of like, even when I first started birding, how I was blown away by like the bright red of a cardinal. So um, I think that's like my favorite thing about atlasing is just the, the novelty to the simple details that are happening all around us, like in our backyards and in the parks that we visit in the, in the sites in the middle of nowhere. Like it's, it's such a great opportunity to appreciate birds in a new way. Um, so I hope that all this gets you excited about this weekend and makes you excited to go out atlasing, whether you've, uh, you've been atlasing a lot or you're trying it for the first time. So uh, with that, I think we'll go ahead and introduce Adrian. I'm, I think she's next if she wants to hop on and introduce herself. All right, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, so quick intro, my name is Adrian Leppold. I am the state songbird specialist with the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And I am the project director for the Maine Bird Atlas. Um, so yeah, let's kick this off. So what does the Big Atlas weekend entail? So it is an attempt to um, accumulate as much information as we can over a short period of time. And so that period of time is going to start this Friday evening at 6 p.m. and will run through the entire weekend. Nocturnal um, checklists and observations count as well. And it will officially end on Sunday night at 11.59 p.m. So as soon as the clock ticks over to midnight Monday morning, the Big Atlas weekend has ended. Um, so any bird observations made and entered into each respective state portal between 6 p.m. Friday and 11.59 p.m. Sunday will count towards meeting um, your state's goals and um, challenges for this friendly competition and what it means to get the checklist into your state's portal. We each have a specific portal in eBird. Basically the portal for any of you who might not be familiar functions as a file folder. You can think of eBird in and of itself as this giant filing cabinet and so we just wanna help organize the bird observation data that you're submitting by state. So for example, in Maine, we have a Maine Bird Atlas portal and I'll let all of the other states um, specify the names of theirs. And then um, I've noticed this question already came up from one of our Mainers. And so I will address that now as well. Um, you have until noon on Monday to submit your data. So spend as much time over the weekend actually in the field atlasing if you're not using the eBird app real time and entering your observations as you go you will have until noon on monday after um, we hit noon the data is going to be downloaded out of the um, eBird data frame and then we are going to um, analyze it um, julie and gabriel have been working really hard to come up with code to analyze everything so we can determine the winners by um, next Wednesday for the awards Zoom ceremony. Um, so that's that's the time frame. So I will hand it over to Gabriel. Hey, thanks, Adrian. Um, I am Gabriel Foley. I coordinate the Maryland and DC Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, I, I love atlasing. It's, I think it's pretty much the best thing out there. Getting to coordinate it is pretty much the best job. Um, I'm gonna tell you about the challenges that we've got. Um, I'm really excited about these. I do have a bit of a competitive streak um, and I am looking forward to seeing Maryland and DC win this. Um, we have a trophy and uh, I'm pretty excited to see that come here. Um, so we've got seven challenges that you can take part in. 
Uh, the winner of each challenge in each state will receive their choice of a Cornell Lab of Ornithology Bird Academy course. Uh, these courses were donated for the Big Atlas Weekend event by Cornell. So we want to say a big thank you to them for their generosity. Uh, each of the challenges is intended to help us meet our goals for this weekend. So that includes things like increasing coverage in blocks without a lot of effort, finding nocturnal species, and you know just, just growing our Atlas community. Uh, you can find the descriptions of the challenges on each state's eBird portal. So if you head, you know, just to the Atlas website on eBird, um, right on the home page, you'll find more information uh, about everything that I'm saying. So if you forget it, it's not a big deal. You can go find it pretty easily. Um, there are some slight differences between each state as well. So if you want to double check anything, just go to that, go to your state's uh, Atlas portal. Um, and you'll find the info there. So, okay, here are the seven challenges that we've got for you this weekend. Uh, if you've never Atlas before, you can submit a complete checklist to the portal. A winner will be randomly drawn from all of the complete checklists that are submitted by brand new Atlasers. Uh, now, Maine is treating all checklists the same for their challenges, just something to keep in mind, whether those checklists are complete or incomplete. But for the other three states, uh, New York, Maryland, DC, and North Carolina, you're going to want to stick with complete checklists. So a complete checklist is just a complete list of all the birds that you were able to identify while you were out atlasing. It basically just means that you didn't intentionally leave a species off your checklist, like, you know, starlings or pigeons or something. As long as you record all the species that you're able to identify, you're submitting a complete checklist. Okay, so the next challenge is just to use breeding codes. Uh, submit complete checklists with breeding codes to be drawn as the winner. Uh, following on that, submit complete checklists with confirmed breeding codes from a priority block to be part of this challenge. Confirm codes are mostly the breeding codes with two letters. So there's codes with one letter, codes with two letters. Um, confirm codes generally have the two letters. Uh, they usually have to do with finding nests or chicks. Priority blocks can be found using the explore tool on each Atlas's eBird website. If you're in Maryland or DC, we don't have priority blocks. Uh, so you can submit checklists to any block that you like. We also want to increase our nocturnal effort. That's, you know, one of the hardest parts of any atlas. Um, you might want to write this down, although it's also on the website for reference, um, like I was saying before, so you don't have to worry too much about it. But nocturnal checklists are considered to be any complete checklist from a priority block and then this is the important part, that was conducted between 20 minutes after sunset and 40 minutes before sunrise. So this is just how eBird defines a nocturnal checklist. Um, if you have correctly submitted a nocturnal checklist, it'll have a little nocturnal tag on, on the checklist. The next challenge varies between regions a little bit. In New York and Maine, you're submitting a complete checklist with at least one confirmed grassland species. Uh, you can find that list on each state's respective website. In Maryland and DC, you're submitting a complete checklist with at least one confirmed priority species. Uh, those are just species that are you know, at risk here. Um, but again, you can find the list of priority species on the website. If you're in North Carolina, you can skip right over this challenge. Uh, for the next challenge, you want to pick a priority block that has less than 20 hours of effort in it. Uh, you can find that using the Explore tool on the website. Uh, you submit complete checklists that are at least five minutes long to be included in this one. And the final challenge that we have for you is similar to the one I just described, except that for this one, you have to find a priority block with no effort in it at all. Uh, this will certainly be a challenge in Maryland and DC. We've had an absurdly fast rate of coverage across the state, 
but it might be easier in North Carolina since their atlas is only a few months old. Once this all wraps up, we'll standardize the results and compare each region. I won't go into the details of exactly how that's being done, uh, but if you're interested, those details are explained on the event page on, on each state's website. All that you really need to know about this competition is that Maryland and DC have the most enthusiastic the most enthusiastic atlasers. So we will be winning this competition. I'm going to challenge you, Gabriel. <laughs> we have the most atlasers in New York <laughs> of any of the atlases. Um, so I'm Julie Hart. I coordinate the, the New York Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, and I was going to talk about the interstate overall state champion winner competition. So um, all the, comp the challenges that Gabriel was just talking about are for individuals. Um, and that's so there'll be, you know, seven winners in each state. Um, but then we also, because we're all a little bit competitive ourselves, um, we also wanted to set up a challenge to, to select an overall state winner. Um, so we determined a, a setup to try to, to try to select in a fair way an overall state winner. And um, we are going to be using three challenges in scoring, um, scoring each of the states um, in order to, to come up with an overall winner. Um, so for that, it's going to be the, the number of Atlas checklists. For each state will be one category. Um, another category will be the number of checklists with a confirmed code. And then the third category will be the number of nocturnal hours. And rest assured, we will be standardizing the data across each state. Um, so don't worry if there's, you know, different size, different number of blocks, different number of people, um, we will control for that. Um, but, but we do um, hope to win all of this in New York because we have the most people. Um, <laughs> and then what, uh, we do have a trophy that we have designed and that will go to this year's winner. And because we have um, set this up to be an annual event, um, next year we will be doing a very similar setup. And then whomever wins next year will be presented the trophy from, from this year's winner. Um, so it will be passed on um, around the states um, for years to come. So with that, um, I think I will leave it to Chris. Thank you, Julie. Um, so welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, welcome to those in my home state of North Carolina, my birth state of New York, my sister state in Maryland, and my bucket list state of Maine, actually. So again, thank you for joining us. I am Christopher Smith. I am the North Carolina Bird Atlas Coordinator. It is my pleasure to welcome you and invite you to the Big Atlas Weekend Training Nights. Um, which will be tomorrow night specifically for each of your states, and that'll begin at 7 p.m. You can find the links to your state's training evenings um, if you go to the website or go to the Facebook event page and then link to the state pages. Um, you can go from there. Um, some states have already sent out invitations and require registration, but each state is a little bit different. So just check out those state pages and you can find out all that information. Um, don't forget, this time next week, we are doing the Big Atlas Weekend Ceremony at the award ceremony. Um, that will be Wednesday night of next week on the 30th at 7 p.m. Uh, you can go ahead and register now. I will include that link here shortly um, in the chat, um, but it is uh, bit.ly uh, bit slash Big Atlas Weekend underscore awards. Um, that email, uh, that link has been sent out. It's also in that Facebook chat. Uh, and it is also very exciting to share with you that as of today, um, Merlin has released the sound ID portion um, for their app. So if you have not opened that app in a while, make sure you update it, um, open it up and give it a chance uh, to explore and assist you with some of those sound IDs. Um, and with that, I am all done with my portion. So I believe I'm turning it over to Doug. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I, I should mention 
Julie, I'm glad you uh, turned your video. Julie, turn your video on for a second. And um, uh, anyone who has uh, any Atlas uh, or big Atlas we Weekend swag, um, if you want to show it off. There we go. Look at these T-shirts. I want to make the quick plug that uh, the, um, the money generated from the, the sale of our swag on the, the T Public store um, is what's going to help keep these events, uh, the Big Atlas Weekend, going in the future. So if you couldn't get a, a shirt or a coffee mug or something like that for, uh, for this year, um, it'll be a fun one. Um, oh, I see that I've, I've my t-shirt sitting in my mailbox right now. It got delivered today. And, um, anyways, thank you. Uh, glad to see the, the link is now in the, in the chat. Just want to make that quick plug that, um, grab yourself, uh, some cool swag, uh, uh, represent your, your States with, um, with those logos. Uh, but thank you to, uh, uh, to our models for, uh, showing off tonight. With that, it's it's uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our our keynote speakers tonight. Um, these are two speakers that are going to talk about female bird song and identification, some other uh, fun female bird activities, as as uh, we'll see. Um, which is such a fun uh, thing to think about with atlasing. Like we we put so much focus on um, you know the typically bright. Uh, male birds and, and singing. And I'm, I've uh, been so happy to see how even just the way we talk about birds um, and their breeding behaviors has changed in, just in the, the few years that we've been doing the main bird atlas. So uh, our two speakers are members of the Galbatross project. Um, perhaps let them really talk about what, what that is about. Um, but they are uh, Stephanie Bilkey, uh, conservation scientist at uh, Audubon Great Lakes and Perbita Saha, the uh, senior editor at Popular Science. So with that, I will turn it over to them to teach us a thing or two about female birds. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Perbita and I am going to share my screen quite quickly. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us uh, before the exciting Atlas weekend. Um, as Doug mentioned, uh, we, Stephanie and I helped co-found the Galatross project, which is still a pretty, uh, infant, um, crowdsourcing science movement. Uh, I just strung a bunch of words together there. Um, but essentially what we're trying to do is have people focus on looking for female birds and, figuring out um, some really unique identifying features for the female type of some of the common species we see around us. Um, some of these facts and features you can go out and find, you know, maybe in your field guide, you can read up on Birds of the World on the Cornell website, but a lot of it is still unknown or it's just passed off as anecdotal information between bird banders or birders um, and ornithologists. So we're really trying to kind of amass this knowledge um, and put together hopefully this uh, public database of information on how we can all better understand and identify female birds out in the field. Um, so it's funny that uh, I have this, we have this first line on our slide because <laughs> as all the um, Atlas leaders have put it, this is a friendly competition, um, but the larger practice of birding with an eye toward females, it, uh, I think what Paula said at the beginning um, in terms of how Atlasing is kind of a departure from the um, get it and go nature of birding, uh, especially if you're like really into, um, you know, chasing rarities and listing and such, uh, focusing on females really makes you slow down. And um, as, you know, uh, founders of the Galbatross Project, we've seen this just in our own personal birding practice. Um, and it's really been about uh, going out to your local patch, 
uh, again, finding like a big flock of a common species and then really uh, homing in on different individuals to understand what they're doing in context um, and seeing how you can differentiate those sexes. Uh, it is a challenge, which makes it um, a really great practice, especially for birders like you who have, um, you know, some experience under your belt and you're looking really to build on your natural history knowledge um, of uh, the species you pursue. Uh, and again, even though it's a challenge, it's fun. Um, and that puts, uh, that's just a testament to birding, right? Um, we don't, we can't understand everything that's out there, but that mystery keeps us going back for more. Uh, so um, yeah, our presentation today will kind of just scratch the surface of some of the tips we've learned um, through our years of focusing on female birds. And uh, we're hoping to cover a few of the species that you might see out um, on your tracks. Uh, oh, and one of those species, the white-breasted nuthatch, uh, so we've got a um, female here. Uh, you can tell by the rather faint gray cap on this bird's head. Um, this is a really great uh, photograph that helps, um, that really helps uh, show that clear difference. Um, in a male, it would be like about the same, the cap would be the same color as the nape of the neck. Uh, so it is a hard one to um, see in the field unless like, you really have a bird out on a clear feeder or your binoculars are really awesome. Um, I've had trouble with it. Uh, so I've really been um, depending on photographs to understand this difference. Uh, and I also hear that it's um, more prevalent in female nut hatches up north. And I'm not quite sure why the reason is behind that. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so as the slide says, why should we look for female birds? Well, um, there are so many reasons, right? <laughs> um, you're all here. So hopefully um, it's not necessarily an audience that I need to convince you, but um, that's what today's presentation is all about. So and as Perbita said, uh, we're just we're just starting to we're just scratching the surface today with our presentation on why paying attention to female birds um, is important, but um, we we already know uh, uh, that this is you know it can be actually it can, paying attention to female birds is huge um, for conservation. We're just starting to learn um, why it might be because you know we've historically had a bias towards males, and that can affect um, so many things from photography. Um, to listening to keying into sounds and um, influencing how we do bird surveys, and then inevitably, you know, surveys that inform conservation. So um, we we do know um, uh, from one study that focused on golden wing warblers, they found that um, the the research was really pointing them towards where males were were spending their time um, on the wintering grounds. But then um, when they started paying attention to females, they learned. Uh, that the females were actually using habitat uh, in a different geography. And so if they only paid attention to males, they would end up conserving habitat in one place and then only really saving half the species. So um, we believe that paying attention to females also makes you a better birder. Um, it actually ties in really nicely with the atlas because you're, you're kind of doing the same thing where you know, when you're paying attention to females, you're paying attention to behavior, you're following individuals around. So you're really keying in on these details that you may not look at otherwise if you're just um, purely out listing. So it, I, I believe that when you're paying attention to females or when you're atlasing, either or or both, uh, it really opens up kind of a new world. And um, like what was mentioned earlier in today's presentation, so that, um, you know, you're you're, you're learning the, the common birds even better when you, when you start to kind of key in on these details. So um, with today's presentation, we're, we're focusing on really a broad overview of things to look for when you're identifying female birds. But again, this is, this is just, the, just the beginning and we really hope this all invites you to um, do your own research and find out you know, some interesting um, ways to identify female birds that you're interested in.
So, and this is just a list of some of the ways that we're uh, using to identify female birds from uh, plumage to size and behavior. A lot of that leads into breeding behavior, which goes well with the atlas, um, vocalizations, habitat usage, and so on. So um, the, the first one that we're gonna talk about is sexual dimorphism. And the, the obvious one that I'm sure you all are aware of is that many, many birds are sexually dimorphic or the males differ from the females um, in their plumage, which is basically what you are seeing right off the bat. You can see these male wood ducks, female wood ducks look quite different. And, um, but there's, there's a couple of different ways that we can categorize sec sexual dimorphism because um, you might see these obvious plumage differences in the wood ducks. Otherwise, you may have more subtle plumage differences that you really might need to kind of look in your binoculars or even have the bird in hand to see. Or, or you can also look for just a patch of difference. So it's like you might, might see a bird in your binoculars at first and say, oh, I don't know what it is. And then you get the, the right view of that, that distinct kind of patch and then, you, then suddenly you know. So um, the obvious ones, I, I think we can all recognize if you know anything about birds, you know which one is the male and which one is the female by looking at this picture. Um, so this is a scarlet tanager, the male on the left and the scarlet or the female on the right. And um, there's uh, when when you're thinking about these obvious differences, it also helps you key in and kind of learn, you know, why these differences developed. You're thinking about you know, sexual selection pressures, meaning that, you know, females may choose males that are brighter, they, they really like the colors, um, but then there's also uh, pressures that kind of lead to a female looking drabber, which is kind of the often the, the, the dynamic that we see with uh, male and female birds uh, that are really different looking is that, you know, the female is often spending time in the nest and it's not, um, it's not adaptive for that a bird to be brightly colored because it brings in, you know, eyes of predators. So that is the case of the obvious one, though I do want to say that sometimes obvious isn't always obvious because uh, sometimes, a lot of times with these birds that are really obvious at their breeding stage, they aren't as obvious in um, their non-breeding state. So scarlet tanager is one where the young males and young females often look similar to the adult female. So when we're making these differentiations, we also have to think about what time of year it is to really uh, be able to know for sure that you're looking at a female bird. Yes, yeah, so we are kind of going along the spectrum of plumage dimorphism here, getting to the more challenging ones, um, but we're still in friendly territory. Uh, with pileated woodpeckers, um, and I'm sorry if you like to say it pileated, but I'm going to stick with pileated for today. Uh, the key with the adults to look for is uh, the malar stripe, so that red mustache. Um, you'll see it on the male on the left versus the female who just has a black malar stripe on the right. Um, and this is a trait that carries over between a lot of the common woodpeckers, um, so you can use it for uh, Northern flickers um, and uh, yeah, um, so it's a fun one. And then uh, with kestrels, um, also very very feisty species and great one to get on breeding habitat. Um, the male on the left uh, is going to have a lot more blue, especially on the wings, um, and the female is going to be pretty much all um, rusty brown and barred along the wings. Um, and I believe there's uh, a little more blue on the back of the male's head as well. Yeah, the, the chest is different on the, the kestrels too. So the, the male, you can't actually see it in that picture, but the male has, has spots and the, the female has streaking on it. And um, one thing that was really fun is that I got to help uh, See, or I got to see some nestlings being banded um, uh, a week or so ago, and they already display those differences as chicks. So that's a that's a really fun, fun one. Can go back to the yeah. So I got the next one is uh, subtle differences. So you may be familiar with the yellow warbler, super common around uh, where I'm at in uh, Chicago area, 
and one, one of our most, most common uh, breeding warbler species. And so we see these all the time. And if you just catch sight or just a glimpse of a yellow dot, you can instantly know, oh, you hear, see that's a yellow warbler. Um, but the male and female difference is a little bit more subtle. Uh, the, the male or the, the main difference is the, the amount of streaking on the chest. And so with the male on the left, you have pretty bold orange streaking. And the female can go from almost no streaking at all to just kind of faint streaks, which you can barely see on this picture on the, on the right. And then the next example is um, the cedar waxwing. And um, this was one of my favorite ones. I didn't learn this until I be, uh, uh, caught one at a bird banding station that I was running. Um, I never knew that you could tell the difference. And um, it's actually in the amount of black on the throat. So um, the male on the left has, <laughs> I think it was actually written in our notes, uh, it has a, a neck beard versus the female on the right, which has a soul patch. <laughs> so basically what that means is that you see a lot of black on the throat on the male and just a, a little bit on the female. And again, that's, that's really hard to see in the field, um, but it's a, it's a fun thing to look for once you, once you know what the differences. Okay, some larger challenges. Uh, so looking at um, our one and only uh, regular hummingbird species on the East Coast, the ruby-throated hummingbird, uh, obviously between adult female and adult male, that's um, less of a challenge. Uh, the name of the bird itself is, um, you know, connected to the male's beautiful gorget. Uh, but when it comes to um, the younger males, that can be much more of a, a tricky ID. So uh, two features to uh, key in on if you're not quite sure. Um, you know, of course, the, the seasonality is going to make a difference uh, if you're going to be seeing young males or not. Um, but uh, if you look on the left, uh, this is a young male and he's got this kind of like cinnamon buffy feathering on his flanks. Um, so that's usually a good sign that it's not female, it's a young male. Um, and then also, uh, I really like this photo on the right of a female because um, you get that full display on the tail feathers. Uh, an adult female is going to have really fresh looking um, retrices. So uh, those tail feathers, they're gonna have like really bold white tips and nice like curved round edges. Um, whereas on a younger male, because uh, he's still preparing to go into um, that next set of plumage, those tail feathers are going to be a lot more shabby and less, um, less uh, demarcated with the white. And uh, this species is a fun, uh, it's one of the favorites of the Galvatross project. Um, again, uh, with, when it comes to adult female American red starts and adult male American red starts, the difference is day and night. Um, but when it comes to the young males, uh, they can look a lot like the females. They have um, the yellow armpits, they have the yellow uh, like patches on the tail. Um, so again, it's a very, very subtle difference. Um, but you'll see with the male on the left, there are some very like random smudgy black feathers on its face. And this is an indicator that, you know, it's going to, um, uh, it's going to glow up to that full, uh, full black and uh, orange uh, plumage that it's going to have as an adult. Um, so yeah, it really helps to have a clear photograph in this case. Um, but if you're ever caught in the field, just, just make sure that, uh, that female you're looking at is all female, you know, very, very clean, gray and white, um, all over the belly and the face and the neck. Cool. So now we are moving off plumage, um, other visual differences. Uh, and this one's size is really helpful in, um, mostly raptors. Uh, 
So as um, many of you might know, a lot of uh, the female types in raptor species are larger than the male types. Um, and there's been some cool research, though still inconclusive on why that is. Um, you know, it could be like a, a whole connection to um, reproduction and, you know, making sure the female can invest enough uh, energy resources into raising this very um, demanding uh, set of raptor chicks. Um, so uh, with red-tailed hawks, uh, the females are about 20% longer. Um, and with bald eagles, the females are generally 25% larger. This is a really hard um, ID feature to depend on because you need to be in a scene where, you know, you're with a confirmed um, mated pair. Uh, so you have that comparison with the males. But as atlasers, um, you're perfectly, you know, set up for that job. Um, so um, along the lines back on color again, um, this is a pretty unique one, but also one of my favorite examples of uh, sexual dimorphism, uh, bill color in European starlings in the breeding plumage. And this is another little factoid that I learned for, only from bird banding because in bird banding, you're, you have the bird in your hand and that's the perfect time to tell things about it that you wouldn't otherwise know, like what approximate age and what is the sex of the bird. And um, I caught a starling when I was doing a master's thesis when I um, was uh, banding birds in, in Wisconsin. And uh, I was like, oh, it's a starling. Like, I, you know, I hope it, I wish it was a, like a warbler or whatever, but like I, I was looking through uh, the, the pile guide, which is basically a bird bander's Bible. And it said, you can tell the sex on um, an adult breeding bird by the, the base of the bill. In the female, it's pink and in the male, it's blue or bluish gray. And I was like, this, this has to be a joke because how, how could, how could this gender stereotype exist in birds, pink and blue? But uh, apparently it's true. And you can see with your own eyes that these pictures are not doctored. Uh, this, is, this is real life. Um, the, the female does have a pinkish color at the base of the bill and the, the male has a, a bluish color. Uh, note that uh, this is only during the summer because in the winter uh, and with juvenile birds, they do have a darker bill color. So you don't see that uh, coloration difference. But um, just one fun fact, and if you really want to look, um, pour through starling flocks with your scope and um, zoom in on that bill, then uh, good luck <laughs> to you. Um, they also do come up pretty close to you, so you might, you might be able to see it without a scope too. Um, another fun one that I just learned uh, a couple of years ago when uh, all the, the, the team members of the Galvatross project, or, or um, at least three of us, were uh, participating in the World Series of Birding, which is a whole nother story that um, we couldn't fit into this presentation. But I, I got to go out to Cape May, New Jersey. Uh, I live in Chicago again, so I don't normally see uh, oyster catchers of any variety. Uh, but uh, we were doing research on what kind of uh, male or female differentiation we could make during our, our World Ser Series effort, which, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't see a lot of uh, female birds, which was our, our goal, so just seeing female birds. But we did see a female American oyster catcher because one of our teammates was able to discover that um, a genetic analysis revealed that uh, only females have a, a trait where they have an eye fleck, which uh, you can see in this picture uh, it, it's basically like an extension of the, the pupil. And uh, so this is, this is pretty uncommon. I don't know other, other birds that exhibit this trait, but it is found in both the American and black oyster catcher. And um, once you see it, it's, it's just something that's really cool. And now, now every time I see an oyster catcher, I'm like, oh yeah, I got to see that eye black. <laughs> and I think that it can... I like I've only only seen the one eye fleck as well, but I think there can be multiple eye flecks. But again, it's any any eye fleck, it should be a female. Awesome. So we made it through plumage and eye flecks. 
Now it's time for behaviors, which is really where the true heart of the atlasing is. Um, so where we could, we tried to incorporate uh, breeding codes. Uh, Stephanie has more atlas experience than uh, I do, so sh she might cite them uh, even better than me. Um, but first of all, first I wanted to start with migratory behavior, even though that's not super relevant right now in the heart of summer. Um, it is, it can be really telling, uh, especially in spring migration and for some species fall migration. Um, generally the trend is that uh, the males of a species, the adult males will uh, travel up north first uh, so they can scope out the territory, um, size up the rivals and, you know, just be ready for when the females come and the whole breeding process begins. Um, so the a place that has really great data on this is uh, the Black Swamp Bird Obser the Black Swamp Bird Observatory up in um, Ohio. Uh, as many of you might know, it's like a really great songbird trap during spring migration um, because of the Great Lakes, and uh, the banders there have. Um, found like long term historical trends in exactly when the male uh, warblers, especially land versus the females versus uh, juveniles. And um, they've found that for a lot of the species, um, I think including black and white warbler and ruby crowned kinglets, the males will be there like 10 days earlier than the females. And that's like pretty standard year to year. To year. Um, so that's really neat. Uh, with ruby crowned kinglets, I mean, they are sexually dimorphic. Um, again, the male uh, gets to lay clay to claim to the name. Uh, they have that ruby crown, but that's not always visible. Um, they really have to flash it for you to be able to tell. So uh, another thing to look out for again is timing. Um, the male, the adult males will be up here in spring a lot earlier than the females. Um, and then in the fall, uh, it will be the reverse. So the juveniles leave or the young birds leave first. Um, then the females, and then the males will like really struggle, at least here in New Jersey, um, up till like October, November. Um, I think Stephanie gave me uh, this tip just the other day that uh, if you see a flock of um, warblers, was it in spring, Stephanie? Um, yeah, kind of like when you're hitting, hitting peak, peak migration and most of the kinglets have, have gone. Um, yeah, so then it, uh, in spring migration, if you see kinglets mixed in with a flock of warblers, they're likely the males because... The females. Are we talking about fall migration? Oh, spring. <laughs> sorry. Okay, gotcha. Um, sorry. So the adult males are beating both the warblers and the females in that case. Um, so cool. I will have to look out for that next spring. All right, um, so pair feeding, and this is where we get into the atlas codes as well. So if you see any birds doing this over the weekend, you can use it, uh, the code C for courtship. Um, so pair feeding is often initiated by the male in many species. Um, doesn't happen in all birds, but you will see it in blue jays, cedar waxwings, and northern cardinals. And um, for blue jays and cedar waxwings, you know, they look very similar. So if you see a bird initiating pair feeding, it's likely the male. And then the, you know, the bird that's receiving the gift is female. Um, and uh, we may, you may definitely see cedar waxwings doing this behavior now because they tend to be pretty late breeders. Um, they, they start nesting in, in July um, to take advantage of, you know, the seasonal fruit that's available later in the summer. And um, when they do this courtship behavior in cedar waxwings, um, the, the male will initiate and he'll pass a berry to the female like in the picture. But um, a fun, fun thing to look for for this bird is that they will pass the fruit back and forth, one, one back to another. So the male will pass the, the berry to the female and then she'll pass it back. And they'll kind of continue doing that for, for some time. And it's really, really fun behavior to look for. Yeah, so one uh, great thing that we've learned through researching these different behaviors is that um, 
people might assume that it's mostly female birds who do uh, the nest building and the incubation and um, the infant care. But there are a lot of bird species where uh, the duties are shared or the male plays a pretty um, good parenting role. So it's been fun to see um, which species, you know, are are uh, balanced and progressive like that versus uh, the ones that, you know, uh, really shunt all the responsibility on the female. Uh, but with nest building, um, there are some there are some species where if you're seeing uh, the birds collecting nest material, it's a good sign that you're watching a female. Uh, so the eastern kingbird is one, um, and the black capped chickadee, so the main um, state atlas uh, uh, mascot. Um, the males will help to actually like excavate the cavity and uh, they'll stick around during the incubation and chick rearing process. But in terms of actually building the nest and the hole, that's, that's all the female. And um, when it comes to incubation, uh, we, we do see a lot of female only incubation in birds. There, there are plenty of birds across the board where they, they share the incubation duties, but more often than not, it seems to be a lot of birds where the female is the incubator. So if you see a bird on the nest um, for some of these species, you may use an occupied nest code or nest with eggs in the atlas. And you may also be able to tell if it's a female if it's a Canada goose, uh, American robin, great crested flycatcher, song sparrow, and all Empidonex flycatchers. So we, we joke that um, even if you can't ID the Empidonex flycatcher like this least flycatcher to species, you may be able to tell if it's a female if you see it sitting on a nest. But uh, I don't want to say that to all you atlasers because you really should know the identification of the species. Otherwise, the, the data is, isn't quite as useful. Um, for, for some of the cavity nesters like Eastern Bluebird and um, uh, uh, Black Cap Chickadee, you can also tell if it's a female that was incubating a nest. If you see a bird that has kind of a crumpled tail that was in a nest box, that may be an indication that it was, was incubating. Yeah, and with um, caring for young, uh, I'm, I decided to focus on waterfowl just because we haven't represented them much in this presentation. Um, and also it's just super cute to see uh, a female with a long chain of uh, chicks behind her. Um, so, uh, I mean, some waterfowl species, again, uh, the care for young is um, split among the parents, um, but in some, it all rests on the female shoulders. Um, so this was a fun story that uh, a photographer, Brent uh, Sichek, um, he came upon a few years ago where he noticed this uh, common merganser female who had just like picked up, I think it was like 70 something um, little chicks had just kind of glommed onto her, uh, which is, um, Quite amazing, uh, but again, you'll have to you'll have to see what you know what species you're looking at because in some like common loons and um, a lot of the grebes, uh, the males will you know be hanging around with the chicks on their back and um, doing just as much work. All right, so as atlasers, you are all very familiar with fecal sacs, right? Or you're about to be. Um, so that's the code FS, um, carrying fecal sac. So that's like a bird diaper uh, <laughs> with songbirds. Uh, the chicks at a certain stage, they produce feces that is packed into kind of like a sealed pack, uh, package so that uh, it makes nest sanitation very easy for the adults where um, instead of, um, you know, leaving droppings everywhere, they can pick it up and uh, move it somewhere far away from the nest so that, you know, predators or other visitors may not be attracted to it. And so nest sanitation, oftentimes it's, it's kind of an overlooked behavior, but from most of the research we found a lot of um, pairs share or the males and females share in this behavior. And kind of knowing this also is, is revealing to how this whole like nesting process goes because 
um, you can see that for the for for many birds, it's very common for the females to do the nest building and incubation, and then as the chicks uh, are hatched, then it shifts for a lot of species where the males and females are sharing in taking care of the young and you know cleaning the nest because suddenly you know there's a lot more responsibility involved in raising uh, you know three to four or five ticks than there was uh, just as in the beginning where the female is sitting and the male is you know busy defending the territory so it's it's fun to kind of see those shifts in responsibilities and how that um, results in in the the different behaviors of the sexes so um, in some species we we do know um, some information that you know one sex uh, is is more it partakes more in the nest sanitation than the other, um, but it all kind of depends on where where the research is. Um, I, I found in downy woodpeckers there was a study where they they saw mostly the male was was doing um, the the fecal sac clearing, and then um, for Dick Sussel it was the opposite. It was uh, uh, all only the female was observed doing doing this. So it's another thing to look at. But oftentimes, you know, it may or may not point you to which one is a female. But in the in the picture with the robin, we we see that, that that's a male because you know that bright orange breast, uh, dark cap. So we know based on the plumage differences. Okay, uh, so we're going to move on to vocalizations. This is going to be a quick section, despite the fact that. This is probably one of the more exciting um, fields of discovery when it comes to learning more about female birds. And again, you all are going to have a great opportunity to um, really dig into female vocalizations and learn something new out there. Um, females are going to be very communicative with um, whether it be males, uh, whether it be with their chicks once they're once they've hatched, um, often when they're on the nest, they might be quieter just to you know stay on the DL. Um, but yeah, there's been a, kind of like a movement recently um, among uh, ornithologists to really understand if um, female birds are as muted as we think they are, um, and what they've found is that. Uh, both ancestrally and in modern songbirds. Um, there are a lot of species where the females do sing. Uh, they're just not, you know, as complex or as prominent as the males. So they've gone relatively unnoticed. Um, one species where uh, we do have a decent amount of understanding is the Baltimore Oriole. Um, so I probably won't have time to play all of these clips, but I'll play the Oriole because that one's probably going to come up in a lot of your ranges. Um, so the female has, um, they do call it a song uh, and it's a similar like sort of um, clear whistle, but it's generally going to um, be a lot shorter and a lot less complex than the male's uh, cheery whistle. And it usually um, is on a descending note. Um, so here is the song. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, you'll probably want to listen to the male song a few times just to make sure like you can actually compare them and distinguish them, um, but they are pretty different. Uh, there was a really weird fact um, that I found that in places where the Bullocks and Baltimore Orioles, um, their range overlaps, they do hybridize. And uh, people have seen cases where uh, when a female Baltimore Oriole mates with a Bullock's Oriole, it actually, she starts to learn the male Bullock's Oriole song a little and incorporating it into her own, which just opens up a whole um, box of questions about how females learn song. Like that's very later in their age. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, uh, again, like I said, lots of exciting um uh, biology to understand there. Uh, I'll also play the great horned owl just because this is a real classic. Um, so when you hear the male and female uh, duetting together, um, you know, an evening in the woods, uh, you should be able to tell them apart from their voices. <laughs> Okay. 
Uh, so the females um, hoots will always be higher pitched than the males. Uh, so that's how you can tell who she is in that partnership. Um, oh, sorry, I don't think that's those. Um, and uh, just highly recommend checking out the Female Birdsong Project. That's the group of uh, scientists I mentioned who have been kind of tracing um, bird song like from the ancestor of songbirds to modern birds trying to understand uh you know what where the like real sexual differences are there all right habitat usage so um like i alluded to earlier uh in the case for the golden wing warblers and Oftentimes with, with uh, our migratory birds in their wintering grounds, they may use diff different, totally different habitats and may even be geographically separated during the non-breeding period. But there's a number of ways that um, the sexes may also use habitat differently, or they may just be appear in different parts of the habitat when you're trying to look for them. Often with you know, females being a little more secretive during the, you know, the incubation stage. Um, so one of the examples we have is a bobolink and red-winged blackbird. We often, you know, see more males than females because the males tend to be more visible when you're walking through an open area. The males are, are showy and they're broadcasting themselves and they're also kind of visible on the top of, uh, you know, at the top of grass. Whereas um, the females are either busy foraging or, you know, tending to their nests and um, they'll be lower in the grass. So it may be harder to see them um, it's, it's always kind of interesting to me when I'm in a grassland and it's like, you almost see just nothing but males and, um, the, the females kind of disappear, but they're also camouflaged. So that, that doesn't help much either. Um, we also have a little information on, you know, downy woodpeckers actually exploit different parts of the tree with the males foraging on, um, small branches and the females tending more to the tree trunk. So that's something that you can look for if you see um, downy woodpeckers in your in your backyard, see if they actually, uh, you know, are using different parts of the tree. Um, with the American kestrel as well, they will segregate um, habitat types a little bit, um, even when they're on the breeding ground. So females will use more of the stick to the grassland, and then males will tend to use uh, edge habitats near uh, forest edge. Okay, this is the fun part to see what you've learned tonight, but also it seems like um, a lot of the audience has had previous knowledge on some of these species and others that we didn't include. So I feel like you all are gonna ace this quiz, um, although it is hard. So we'll put that up front. Um, thank you everyone for hanging in. I know it's past eight o'clock, so we'll go pretty quickly through these. Um, basically, I will uh, show you the photo and um, you can tell us if you think it's a male or female type of the species. Um, you can type it into the chat if you want, or you can just, you know, um, keep track on your own. And then Stephanie will uh, quickly go through the answers. So here's number one. Okay, and finally, uh, I do have a sound clip. Um, to make it really hard, I would have made you guess off the sonogram, but we will not, or sorry, spectrogram, not sonogram, um, but we won't do that. I will actually play it. <clears throat> oh no. <laughs> uh, okay, maybe we'll skip this one. Um, I'm sorry, I thought I linked specifically to the clip that I needed, but. Um, Okay, cool. So we'll just go with the four, first four questions. Um, so I will uh, track back and then Stephanie, if you wanna go through. All right, well, if you guessed um, male, you're correct. This is an immature male red start. And we know that because the black feathers are coming in on the face. Okay, 
And again, we have another young male. This time it's a ruby-throated hummingbird. And this is uh, pretty easy to miss, but you can see one tiny throat uh, gorget feather coming in the little red patch. So soon this will be a beautiful adult, but it's, it's uh, still, still, um, still growing. And number three, we have uh, another bird that we talked about in the beginning. This is the female white-breasted nuthatch. And you can tell her apart from the, the male by the gray cap uh, contrasting with the black nape, whereas the, the male has an all black cap. And lastly, I saw a number of answers that were correct on this one. Another female, this is a female pileated woodpecker. Um, which lacks the, the red mustache uh, that Perbita pointed out, but also um, missing the red feathers um, in between the, the cap and the, the, the uh, beak. So usually the, the male has an all red cap that extends all the way across the crown to the, the, the base of the beak. And then the last one was the, the female Baltimore Oriole, but I saw that was given away in the <laughs> when you clicked on that link. Oh, whoops. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, um, one thing I do like uh, looking at the spectrograms, um, especially with, you know, like the nuanced uh, female to male um, vocalization differences. I mean, if you're just like a visual learner, it helps to actually see um, those sound waves and how they look different. Um, and that hopefully connects back out into the field when you hear the different um, voices. Uh, cool. So these are um, our co-founders of the Galbatrust Project. Uh, I know Joanna was um, in the audience tonight, um, and they are all really awesome Audubon scientists and birders and um, science communicators. Uh, and our website is right here, femalebirdday.wordpress.com. Um, and again, like these are just... Um, we just covered like a few different clues that uh, we've turned up during our um, eternal search for uh, female um, female wisdom, female bird wisdom. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully you can spend uh, this weekend and the many weeks ahead uh, learning a lot more and um, personalizing, you know, your experiences with female birds. Uh, and here's some of the resources we used um, for our research. Uh, Birds of the World, you do need a subscription to that, but there are some really good entries about like breeding behavior and such. Um, someone asked like if there's a good resource for female bird song. Um, I, the Female Bird Song Project, they have some examples and clips, but I wouldn't say like it's, you know, a good like it's not like a great study guide. Um, if you go, if you search through the Macaulay Library um, and just, you know, filter for female bird calls um, with like the species you're interested in, that could be really helpful. Just note that not all of those like IDs are confirmed. So I know like I've included photos that were not actually females and Stephanie was like, hmm. Um, so yeah, take that. Uh, Take that with your own um, fact-checking skills. And uh, yeah, just talk to other atlasers, talk to um, the experts who are running the atlas in your state. Uh, if you come across uh, bird banders while you're out there or um, shorebird monitors, like these folks are huge wealth, have huge wealths of knowledge. And um, most times people love to share. So uh, yeah, keep, keep spreading the good word. Cool. Um, yeah, so any uh, open questions? Don't want to keep you all for too long. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, okay. So I think we answered the, fem the resource for B female bird song. I don't know, Stephanie, do you have any other tools that you use. I mean, maybe the new Merlin song ID feature is going to end up being an awesome resource. We'll have to put to, we'll have to put it to the test. Uh, 
Oh yeah, I don't I don't know. <laughs> I'm still learning when it comes to female bird song. That's that's yeah. a tough one. But yeah, as you as um I think you showed on your screen when you were look you were searching the Macaulay Library, you can search by sex, which is pretty cool. Oh, someone did ask about oh sorry. Um I think we're maybe time's up or no, I have a question actually. Oh, you have a question. Okay. Um <laughs> I noticed um I noticed on your, your website that you have like a form where people can submit observations, um, their own anecdotal evidence. Um, and one, I just wanted to, to point the listeners to that resource, that that's a, a great way to, to, to help add to our growing knowledge. Um, but two, I wondered um, if you had like a list like by species and like here's all the like the tips for distinguishing the sexes like ha have you compiled that and made it available anywhere or anything like that yeah oh and actually I was I was just trying to scroll back up to see your question and I saw that you asked that in the chat so yeah um yeah so we do have a list on our website or a form that you can enter uh information on female bird observations and I already saw a lot of great ones in the chat um that that people were noticing you know songs that they've heard and and other 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 cool traits so you can enter um species observation data on on what kind of how you knew something was female what bird it was um you know when and where you saw it and or all you know, however you want to describe it. And we hope that someday that we'll be able to share that as a resource and have it out there because, you know, there isn't really just like one resource to female bird identification. Yeah, and someone also asked um, if we could summarize like the different species uh, we covered in this presentation. So um, yeah, I'll also, look to upload these presentations on that website um, so they can be accessed easily. Uh, I also liked this question, um, and there are also a few general Atlas questions here. So if any of the Atlas um, leaders want to chime in, that totally works. Uh, but does female singing serve the same purpose as male singing? Um, I mean, conventional wisdom is that most of the, like, you know, flashiest male songs are specifically for like mating attraction. Um, so most females probably aren't do, doing that. But if you generally think about the purpose of song and calling, I mean, it's communication, just like among humans. Um, so females are communicating, again, whether it be with their mates or um, with their chicks or whether it be with a threat. Um, there have been some cool studies on female uh, superb lyrebirds in Australia, and they actually also will mimic um, sounds that they've heard in their environment, um, sometimes hawks, they'll mimic hawks, just to scare away um, any unsavory characters that are hanging around their nests. Um, so yeah, different purposes, um, possibly, but we're still learning more about that. Oh, I, I have something to add to that too. It's a really cool fact is that um, we've, uh, well, because of the Female Bird Song Project, which is, you know, another project outside of what we're doing, but um, they've, they've uh, you know, compiled how many female birds sing out of, you know, all the species in the world. And we've, they've found that um, more female birds sing in the tropics. It's actually very common to the point where we think that, you know, it was actually normal for female birds to sing. And then as they um, moved into um, areas with, you know, shorter breeding seasons, female actually lost their song. Um, and that's so the purpose of females and males singing together would be to both share in the practice of defending a territory. And um, when the breeding season is shorter up here in the Northern latitudes, um, you know, there's, there's less time to focus on, you know, uh, defending the territory and the female has to put more time into incubating just in that little narrow window. So, you know, in the tropics, they'll be defending their territory year round and in the, the northern latitudes or in the southern too, um, you know, with that shorter window, they, they, they kind of change, change their behaviors and lose, lost their songs. Okay, and then someone asked, uh, what purpose do the iFlex on the oyster catchers serve? 
speculation strongly invited. Um, yeah, I would really, I don't know about, I don't know enough about oyster catcher um, and their lives to uh, even be able to speculate. Although, you know, when you see like dark pigmentation, um, usually there's some connection to uh, like sun protection or, you know, just endurance of like the organs or feathers or whatnot. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know why that would be different among female oyster catchers versus males though, because I do think they're both out on the nest, um, out in the hot sun. So that wasn't a very good speculation. If, if you don't know the answer is always sexual selection, right? Even though we have no idea, you know, why birds are selecting traits over the other, but it's, you know, maybe it's like an aesthetic thing that they just like. <laughs> I was just going to throw in too, that it'd be interesting. I don't know if anybody's looked at uh, oyster catcher eyes under black light. That might not actually be good for them, but because birds see in the ultraviolet, we know puffin bills actually glow um, different colors uh, in the UV spectrum. So I wonder if that's something with a female maybe those flecks look different to birds than what we are seeing in our visual spectrum yeah that's an awesome um yeah that's a better speculation <laughs> Uh, I think it looks like we've we've hit all the um, questions, at least things that got into the um, q and I need to give a quick shout out to my wife, ran to the mailbox for me. Um, so uh, still time to get your, your orders in, but um, I just wanted to make sure that we all, uh, uh, especially before folks hop off here, we want to, um, unfortunately in webinar, we can't see everyone, but um, if we can virtually put our hands together um, post all of our, our, our virtual claps in the chat. Um, but to really thank Stephanie and Perbita for um, giving us the time tonight and uh, teaching us so much about um, female birds, which is, uh, again, such an important part of atlasing. So uh, really appreciate uh, the two of you coming and, and uh, being a part of this event. And I certainly learned a lot. I didn't think, uh, I didn't think we'd be hearing about underbeards and um, uh, goatees or whatever, whatever the uh, comparison was. That, that was fantastic. I can't wait to use that on a bird walk or something. Yeah, thanks for having us. Now I understand how uh, bloodthirsty state atlases are um, when, you know, rivaling each other. All right. Um... Yeah, if anybody has any additional questions, feel free to throw them in the chat really quick before we hop off. Otherwise, um, if you post them on, um, if you go to the landing page of your state, you should be able to find contact information there if you have additional questions throughout the weekend. Um, and it'd be good to get connected with your state atlas if you're not already connected. So, um, yeah. Yeah, look for all the, um, each state will have a different training event tomorrow night. Um, so if you had Atlas specific questions that maybe didn't get addressed, uh, um, and I think Glenn just put those, the links to the uh, various eBird pages, which should link you to your state's uh, events. Um, so check that out, go to those events tomorrow. You'll, you'll learn a lot and be ready to hit the ground running uh, this weekend. Um, and then it'll be next week at this time, we'll have our uh, award ceremony. So um, uh, I can't wait to see that, that beautiful trophy on its way to Maine, um, wherever it may go. Uh, I hope everyone has a, a great fun weekend. Uh, be safe, find lots of birds, go to your priority blocks um, and keep your cats indoors. <laughs>